Giant Dragons. Hey, Diddly D, my name's Jonathan Henry, and I am your ringmaster here at Giant Dragons. In this episode of Giant Dragons, I'd like to take you back to 1988. It was a big year for many reasons. The USSR was changing, and with only four years left of life in it. NASA started its space shuttle program back up after the Challenger accident, and Tom Browning of the Cincinnati Reds pitched the 12th perfect game in baseball history. And most importantly of all, I caught the gaming bug and have been at it ever since. This issue of Dragon found its way into my paws and started expanding my idea of what a game could be. With articles on wilderness adventures, hunting, the weather, and loads of other mammals I could use to chase my players across the forest and plain. It sparked the idea of mutants as PCs and gave me an opportunity to throw a little gaiety into the mix with fairs and festivals. As became standard form for Dragon Magazine, this issue opened with letters from gamers worldwide. This issue seemed to be a spot for folks to brag or be generally rather bizarre. We are introduced to Waldorf, a wizard of some might, so we are told. With hindsight being what it is, I can tell you that the mighty wizard Waldorf later crossed the plains and became a salad magnet in New York City. Wilderness Adventures were the next stop on the literary perusal of these pages as David Hollery asks what for lunch. Introducing new and interesting ways for your characters to flex their murder hobo muscles on some unsuspecting critters. David continued with the next article called Treasures of the Wilds, showing that there is gold in them there dungeons giving your characters a chance to flex some of those non-weapon proficiencies. It gave values for pelts, skins, ivory, poisons, carcasses, eggs, and young, as well as other oddities you can take from a monster. It even states the value of the hide of everyone's favorite Herculean starship captain. Next, Greg Chamberlain talks about the ecology of carnivorous plants. Showing us the dark side of photosynthesis, Greg goes about introducing a few new ways to get stuck in the woods for the rest of your life. Giant Venus fly traps that move faster than the eye can track, huge pitcher plants, man traps, tri-flower frond, and the blood thorn. While giving your DM a new way to kill you, it also gave new opportunities to collect treasure, as the seeds, narcotics, and other chemicals can be used in a great many ways by a smart group of murder er adventurers. Lisa Cabela's article called Weathering the Storms got me as a young, secretly evil GM to really bring the rain on many of my games. Being on foot and exposed to the elements was something that I well understood as a 12-year-old in Ohio, but I had not taken the time to inflict the elements on my players. Yet there is no more of a hollow TPK as one achieved by a snowstorm. David Howery returns to show us something more fitting to kill your players with in his article called Into the Age of Mammals. Warm-blooded critters from the distant past, from dogs the size of lions to sloths the size of a 1975 Oldsmobile. With animals from 2,588,000 years ago till just around 11,000 years ago, loads of I'm happy they're all dead monsters roamed the earth. As mammals spread out all over the world, they came into contact with our human ancestors and ate them, or vice versa. Bill Vocker joins in bringing the fun to your table with the fairest of the fairs, reminding us all that a D&D &D game that doesn't have the occasional party for the party is just all work and no play. With enough holidays to fill an American calendar, it should keep your party looking forward to St. Cuthbert's Day all year long. Douglas Niles is next up to bat with a quick review of the Hunt for Red October game. TSR takes a moment to write themselves a love letter about their new board game. The whole thing comes across like a recitation from a Chinese politician on just how darn spiffy things are going in China. But never fear, Kim Eastland comes along and saves the day by pointing out that those polluted streets and dangers around every corner is actually Gamma World. So while the water in China may cause you to mutate, odds are against those mutations being as useful as those contained in the tables of Dragon Magazine. Skip Williams comes at us with some sage advice about classes in 2nd edition Dungeons and Dragons. Then we find ourselves face to face with Ula the Watcher, or in this case Jeff Grubb, as they answer questions about Marvel superheroes role playing game. Jim Bambra comes aboard to talk about two games for playing modern day, well, modern in the day, spies. James Bond and Top Secret SI. The Thinking Machine rounds it all out with a look at the newest in video games of the day. In this issue, they spotlight Ultima 5, a fantasy game that I'm sure no one has ever heard of. It fits neatly with the two other video games advertised in this issue. All three of the games are very D&D-centric type games. Do a good job of filling time 
between games, as well as adding to the possible recruiting pool of new players who at least now have a glimmer of an idea. This issue includes a few pages of advertisements for the odds and ends of old, play by mail and the odd assortment of dice. FASA and Palladium games also play large as well as TSR games, books, and novels. Finally, Larry Elmore makes an appearance with a few pages of Snarf Quest, by far the best of the cartoons to ever grace the pages of Dragon Magazine. This is a great issue to get you thinking outside of that little cardboard box that many of us got our first games in, with information on getting your games out of the dungeon and into the greater world around them. Thank you for taking a trip down memory lane and looking back 27 years into a periodical that still has relevance today. Thank you very much. My name is Jonathan Henry, and I'll see you next time.